So at this time, I'm going to ask Kevin DeLapp to come up here. Good morning. Please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10, verse 34. Thanks for the opportunity to come and share with you. I had a great time with the kids yesterday. Before I begin, I got to ask a question. Where do you people live? <laughs> I, I saw a lot of trees and a few horses, but very few houses on the way up here today. It's always amazing to me when I drive up around here and see a church this large in a place this unpopulated. So uh, God bless you for wherever you drove from. Backyard Ministries is a Christian outreach to poor and needy children and their families who live in government housing projects and other poor neighborhoods in Lewistown, Mount Union, Huntington, and Altoona. Last year, we had the opportunity from our minister, our ministry to bless more than 1,000 people at their doors in these needy neighborhoods. We have engaged, last summer, probably more than 500 children attended backyard clubs somewhere in these four towns. We have about 275 children that we are regularly engaging in these neighborhoods and working with. We have more than 200 adults engaged in our home Bible study program. Our model is incredibly simple. We find a needy neighborhood and we go there and then we go back. We do ministry right in the backyard. This idea that God blessed us with has been so powerful in the two and a half years that we've been doing this full time that we are now raising funds to expand our ministry. Uh, we are actually now at the point of having a great need for a second full-time missionary in neighborhoods. We have many neighborhoods that are opening up in front of us that we have opportunity to go in, and we also have more opportunities in the neighborhoods that we are currently in. So we are incredibly blessed to be able to do the work that we do. And we are incredibly blessed to have your support. You may not know this, but you are what I would consider to be a foundational church in the support of this idea, of this concept of our ministry. About two and a half, well, it was almost three years ago now, so it was in the spring time, I came up here and met with Pastor Jeff and uh, Pastor Jim right over there. And um, I was still a full-time teacher, and I came up to talk to them about something God had laid on my heart. Uh, that uh, this ministry work in the neighborhood, this concept of going to neighborhoods and working right in the backyard. I'd done it for about seven years in just the summer times, part-time with some kids from Belleville Mennonite School. And um, God had put on my heart that, that it was time for me to go into this work full-time, and I needed partners. And uh, one of the hardest things in the world for me to do is ask people for money. Uh, and uh, it might be the hardest thing in the world for me to do. Uh, it's not something natural to me, although I have to say I'm getting better at it the longer I'm in this business. Um, but uh, I came up here, and it's one of the first people I met with were your pastors. And I shared the idea with them, and they were incredibly gracious. And um, within a couple months, uh, your church board voted to take us on as one of your missionaries uh, and uh, began providing us $2,000 a year uh, to do the work that we do. And You'll just have no, there's no way for me to explain to you how encouraging that first church commitment was to me because I'd never done anything like this and I had no idea if anyone, if anyone would look at us and say, okay, we'll support that idea. And uh, you did, and it gave me a lot of uh, encouragement. We now have 35 churches that support us in one way or another in the work that we do. You also were, I think, the first church to come on board with our mobile soup kitchen. The idea of blessing people at the door with food as a way of uh, meeting folks in the neighborhood and engaging them. Those 200 people that are in the home Bible study are a direct result of just engaging people at the door. Beavertown Bible Church, Sherry and, and, um, and Stacy, 
and Polly and other ladies from this church uh, have for several years now been giving us food twice a month to take it to Hartman Village and to give away. And we have met just family after family after family. We've seen more than 150 kids trust Jesus as their Savior uh, in the two and a half years that we've been full time. And so your church has been foundational. Your youth group raised money for us a couple of years ago. Uh, at the point, at the time when they sent us that check a couple of years ago, it was the largest donation we'd ever had at that point. And that first year when we uh, went full time and, and ran out of money about 11 months in, or, or I say nearly ran out of money, came very close to running out of money and not being able to function, that check from your youth group was critical in allowing us to continue uh, that particular year. Um, and uh, again, your youth group is raising money. And I'm sure you've done a lot of other things like donate socks and, and uh, hats and gloves and all kinds of things, I think, along the way uh, to help us out. I can't remember maybe everything you've done, but you've been an incredible blessing to our ministry, and we thank you uh, for that and for your continued support. A man said to Jesus, How do I get to heaven? Jesus said, what's the Bible say? The man said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, do that, and you'll get to heaven. The man said, because he's like you and me, he's not quite totally comfortable with the idea of loving all his neighbors. The man said to Jesus, but who's my neighbor? And Jesus said, let me tell you a story. There was this guy, this man, he was on a journey and he was attacked and robbed and beaten. And he was left along the side of the road to die. And a very religious man came along and he saw the man lying there. He just walked by on the other side of the street. And another guy, just like the first, came along, very religious, very devout, thinking that he knew everything he needed to know about God, saw the dying man on the side of the road, and he walked right by. But then this other guy came along, this Samaritan. He saw the man on the side of the road, and he had compassion on him. And he walked across the street, and in Luke 10, 34, it says he went to him, he went to him. And he took care of the man. He bound up his wounds and he took care of the man. And Jesus turned around and looked at the guy that had asked him, how do you get to heaven? And he said, which one of these three was neighbor to the dying man? And he said, the one that had compassion and showed mercy. Jesus said, do that. Do that. And you'll get to heaven title of the message that I have that God has laid on my heart for you today is he went to him he went to him let's pray heavenly father as we open your word today God um, we are blessed Lord that you come to us that you come to us with your love with your mercy with your forgiveness with your salvation Lord that Jesus came here to this earth, that your Holy Spirit can be here with us right now, God. And as we look at this story, Lord, compel us, God, teach us, Lord, that because you came to us, you want us to go to them, Lord. Teach us what it means to follow the words he went to him. Teach us, God, how we can cross the street and save the world, Lord. By the power of your Holy Spirit, God, we ask you to speak. In Jesus' name, amen. He went to him. He crossed the street. The Samaritan crossed the street to care for the dying man. The world is dying. The world is dying Spiritual darkness, economic dependency, family dysfunction, and addiction are wrecking the fabric 
of our society. Most of the help that you give us goes into Mount Union. You don't have to spend too much time in Mount Union to realize that Mount Union is dying. The world is dying. And the only hope for a dying world, the only hope for a dying Mount Union is Jesus Christ. That's the only hope. I told the kids yesterday, I see a lot of heartache every day. And I'm blessed, actually, (laughs) to see the heartache I see because it gives me the opportunity to share Jesus Christ with people in need. That doesn't wear me down at all. But you know, the saddest thing I see is a church unwilling to cross the street. That's the saddest thing I see. When I see the need in the neighborhoods and then go to the church and I see family after family after family that could make a huge difference in another family's life. But see how incredibly unwilling the church is when it comes to crossing the street. You, when you support the kids raising money, when you support your awesome um, upward program, when you give food to our ministry and other things that you do, you cross the street. You cross the street. The dying man needs the church to cross the street. I think there's a central question here when you think about it, and it's a simple question. Okay, how do we do that? If you are listening to this, and so far you're still with me, and you're thinking, okay, I buy that. I need to cross the street. That's pretty clear. You can't really argue with that. How do we cross the street? How does the church cross the street? I think there are probably two fundamental ideas about that. The first idea is the one we often use is our primary idea, and that is let's create a program. Let's create a program for the dying man. If we just create the right program and we have the right facility and we have the right helpers and we have everything right, we will save the dying man. But we have to have an awesome program. And if there's anything that Backyard Ministries tries to not be, it's a program. It's hard not to be a program. And I want you to understand, I'm a program person, okay? I'm a program person. The first thought in my mind is always to create an awesome program. That's one idea. That's what we mostly do. If we care at all, we try to create a program. The other idea is to just cross the street. It's just to go. See what God does. And really, we've, Backyard Ministries has created a few programs, and they're nice. But the truth is the real power in this is just walking across the street and knocking on the door and talking to folks. That's really the real power of it. That's really where all of those numbers come from. Just from going. The best example I have, most recent example I have is this. I had a couple moms or a couple uh, older ladies that were um, retired and they came to me and they said, actually separately, they didn't know each other. Both of them kept asking me, well, when are we going to do something for the, for the moms in the neighborhoods that you're meeting at the door? We want to somehow connect into them. And I said, well, let's meet and talk. So we met, the three of us, and we devised an awesome program. We had transportation for free. We had food. We had babysitting. And we had awesome leaders. I went door to door, and I talked to the ladies that I've met in Lewistown, in the neighborhoods, and I said, this is a program we have for you. We're going to start in a couple weeks. Would you like to come? Yeah, everybody thought it was an awesome program. They were blessed. First night we had the program, no one came. So these dear, dear retired ladies packed up the food and they went to the doors and they gave it away. You know what they do now? These ladies go and they have Bible studies in people's homes in poor neighborhoods. You see, so I'm talking to myself as much as I'm talking to you when I say the answer is not a program. That doesn't mean that every program is bad. There are good programs out there. I'm saying the mindset that we can't do anything. This is really the danger. We can't do anything because we don't have a program. (laughs) 
or we don't have the people to have a program, or we don't have the facilities. We have to wait till we get enough money to air condition the church before we could ever do anything in the summertime. I'm against that idea because I spend my summers in 90 degree heat with gnats all over the place, and I have kid after kid after kid that just wants to be at our program that's right next to their house in their neighborhood. And it doesn't involve anything. It doesn't involve money. It just involves a little time and a little effort. So I would say to you that I, my message to you today is why not just go? Why not just cross the street? And then maybe later create a program, you know? Why not cross the street first and then have a program later as the second thing, but not the first thing? And I would suggest to you that I have found, in my experience of crossing the street, three really, really powerful things associated with that. Now, before I go any further, I want to make this really clear, okay? I've never preached on the Good Samaritan until the last few months. And the reason is, is I hate things that seem too obvious. It seems like the most obvious thing for a guy like me to talk about, and I hate that. I like, to, I like you to come and hear me talk about something and say, wow, he took that scripture and made it like this, and I, I like to do that. Well, Good Samaritan is obvious. But the second reason is this. I don't want you to be confused and think that I'm up here saying to you, I'm a Good Samaritan, and you're not. I absolutely don't want you to, you know, because I want you to understand this. I get paid for what I do. All those numbers and all the interaction I have at the door, I get paid for that. That doesn't count for me, in my opinion. The Good Samaritans are the volunteers that come and work with me that get paid nothing. Dozens and dozens of people that come every week to a neighborhood and spend one or two hours in there with the kids. The ladies that make the food in the morning for nothing. The people that buy the food for them. The people that donate. Those are the Good Samaritans. I, I, to be a good Samaritan, I've got to go do something I'm not paid to do. Do you understand that? So I'm talking to myself, and that's in how do I deal with my neighbor across the street. That I don't get paid to go do anything for my neighbor. You understand that? So I want, I want you to understand, I'm not up here saying, I'm a good Samaritan, you need to be like me. Uh, I'm not the example of the good Samaritan. <laughs> I need this message as much as anybody else would, okay? But there are three things that I found out in going that you need to know. The first is that there is a power, a power associated with going that is not of yourself. There is something associated with going that has nothing to do with you or me. When we first started this ministry part-time almost 10 years ago now, we spent a summer in a neighborhood in Lewistown, and after the summer, one day a week, again, for an hour, with the kids. And at the end of the summer, we had met all the kids in the neighborhood. We had developed relationships with them, with some of their parents, and it was awesome. And then we all went back to school and we thought, well, we're not going to see these kids for like nine months. And we thought, we'd like to see them again. So in November, we devised this idea of going back and giving hats and gloves to the kids, doing a little club right before Thanksgiving, and taking a homemade pumpkin pie to the family in each house in that neighborhood and we did that i'd never done anything like that before so i'm going around knocking on doors and people saying i had i don't know what people were going to do when i did this i had no idea how they were going to react i'm knocking on doors and door after door after door these people answer the door it was like it was the best thing that any person had ever done for them in their entire life and i'm holding this pie and i'm thinking this is nothing this is just a pie but the reality that someone else had made a pie for their family for Thanksgiving was overwhelming to people. There is a power in going. There's just a power associated with it. It's more than a pie. We've been doing this now, th these pies we've been doing, them. that's where the idea of the food came from. We've been doing the pies for 10 years now, and it's the same thing every year. I just did it again at Thanksgiving. We gave out like 150 pies. Same thing, door after door. My question is for you. I want you to think about this for a second. What if you just went? What if you just made a pie and went to somebody's house in a needy neighborhood at Thanksgiving? What if you just did that? What if you took some food and just went and showed up? I wonder what 
you would start to see the power of going. There's something powerful. Think about this. Dying man on the side of the road. Does he care who crosses the street? No. He sees someone cross the street. That's the best day of his life, isn't it? Right? When you're dying, all you want. See, this is what the church is doing. The church mostly is doing this. Oh, there's a dying man over there. Let's get together and see if we can figure out a way to get him to come across the street. The dying man is not coming across the street. There's lots of reasons for that. They're not coming across the street because they're dying. They need you and me to come to them. There's a power in just going. Second thing, again, is something that our ministry is all about. I call it the power of presence. One of the things I found out right away when I started to do this work in the neighborhoods, I want to get a sense of what's the, what do the people in these neighborhoods think about the church. So I'll tell you a couple things they think about the church. They think the church is full of a lot of people that have more money than them and that they're not welcome there because they don't have enough money. I'm just telling you. I'm not saying that's your fault, but that's what they think. Okay? The other thing is they think the church is full of people that don't have any problems, that don't make any mistakes, and so they're not good enough to come in here with you. All right? And that's not true either. But the truth is, you say, well, we never presented ourselves that way to people. Well, some Christians have presented themselves that way to people. That's just true. I go to churches that say to me, Kevin, I can give, pastors will say to me, I can give you money. But my church is not ready to have your folks from your neighborhoods come here. These are strong churches. Strong churches. They have lots of money and lots of resources and do lots of good things. But the truth is, they're not, they're not able to absorb the people of Hartman Village because the congregation don't want them. That's just true. That's just absolutely true in some places. You don't have to have that happen to you more than once to begin to look at the church as a whole this way. Would you agree with this? If you're poor and you feel unwelcome or unworthy to go to church or not rich enough, you don't need that to happen more than once for you to decide that's what all churches are about, right? So that's one thing I found out in the neighborhoods. I've also found out what, you would, what we would all assume, which is people don't want to leave the, ch- the neighborhood and come to the church because they don't want to be told to live their lives a different way. And that's true. That is true as well. That's part of the conversation. Okay, people want to live their lives the way they want to live their lives. I understand that's part of the conversation. But the other parts also exist. One of the most profound things, though, that I hear in the neighborhood is is that the church, they say, doesn't never come here. It's not like they never come. But they don't come back. See, churches will often devise a program where they'll say, let's go to Hartman Village or Chestnut Terrace and let's do a week of ministry. Great idea. And then they disappear for a year. Or they don't even come back the next year. They do it one time. And they talk about it. And we get together and we say, remember that year we went to Chestnut Terrace? And yeah, we met all those kids and it was great and some people got saved. And then you never went back. In our story, this would be like the guy, the Samaritan, going across the street to the dying man and healing, you know, helping him pour some oil and wine into his uh, wounds, patching him up a little bit, but before he's totally healed, walking away and saying, all right, buddy, good luck with you. <laughs> you know? That's what the church often wants to do. They just want to show up high impact, let's get a week in here, and then we're gone. I want to tell you something that I think is incredibly powerful, that there is a power in presence. There's a power in going back. That's a central principle of our ministry. When we start a program in a neighborhood, we're saying to that neighborhood, we are coming back. You're our neighborhood. We will be here week after week after week, year after year after year. The church has come to your neighborhood. Now what we do is we have churches that we engage that will come in and do something special for a week, which is awesome. But we're there next week. And the next week, so when you support us, you help us to be there week after week after week to fill those gaps because that's what the church has to do. they got to come and do the special Bible school. There's nothing wrong with that. That's an awesome thing. But they also have to be there throughout the year because the need is greater than a one-time or two-time a year 
program. I'll give you a couple quick stories about power of presence. So we show up at the door with food, many times food that you guys have provided to us. Once a week we try to engage. If we, don't, if we can't engage them once a week, at least a couple times a month. Most of the time, the response at the door is great graciousness and thankfulness right from the beginning. Sometimes people are a little cautious, looking at me like, what, I'm taking soup from you? you know, I don't know you when I first meet them. But usually within a month or so, people are just like, oh, hey, Kevin, how you doing? Thank you so much. That's normal. Let me tell you of one situation that wasn't normal. I went to Chestnut Terrace when we first started giving food away there a few years ago. I knocked on this door. Door opened up, and this guy was in the doorway. He filled the whole doorway, big guy. Bald guy like me, tattoos all over his body, and a shirt on it, that, a shirt that said something about evil on it. And I said, hello, my name's Kevin. I'm with Backyard Ministries. I have some food for your family today. And the guy just glared at me. I mean, angrily. Didn't say one word. Didn't even acknowledge that I was there. Just stared me down. So after a couple awkward seconds, I turned around and walked away. I went back the next week because I'm not that smart. I don't know if you feel that way about yourself, but I'm definitely not that smart. And uh, so I went back the next week, same deal, a couple times like that. And then God put on my heart, okay, <laughs> you know, the obvious. This guy didn't want you at, your do- at his door, <laughs> okay? So I stopped going to the guy's door. And I just would walk by and bless other people around his house and just pray for him that God would open the door to talk to him. And that went on for months. And then God said, go back to the door. So I went back. And when I knocked on the door this time, his wife opened the door, and she took the food. Didn't say anything, just took the food. So I went back again. This time the man opened the door again. He didn't say anything to me, but he took the food. So that really encouraged me. So I went back a couple more times. That went on for a while. And then, last summer, I went back and I handed the man the food and I said to him, Sir, I apologize. I've been coming to your door for more than a year now, and I do not know your name. I said, My name's Kevin. He said, My name's Dave. I said, It's nice to meet you, Dave. He said, It's nice to meet you, Kevin. A couple weeks later, In September of every year, we go around and we ask all the families that we've engaged if they would like to participate in a home Bible study. Now, I want to make sure you understand what this is. We're not going into each house and running a Bible study. I'd need 10 of me to do this, if that's the case. We don't do that. I wanted to do that initially, but again, I'm not that smart, and God keeps showing me better ways to do things that make more sense for these people and their situation. And so what God put on our heart was just to write a Bible study, paper, just a one-page piece of paper that is a once-a-week walk through the Word of God that we put in the door for the people that say they want to have it, only those people. And so each September, we'll go around, we knock on the doors, and we'll say, we have this home Bible study paper. We will put it in your door each week if you want to have it, only if you would like to have it. It walks through what the Bible says about how God can help us with life, which is often very, very difficult. Would you like to have this paper in your door each week? I will bring it to you each week. It's written just for the folks that we work with in these neighborhoods. I'll bring it every week and put it in your door. Would you like to have this paper? So we're doing this in September. So in September of this year, I'm going through Chestnut Terrace and Mount Union door-to-door. This is about two weeks after Dave told me his name. I'm going down the street, and I get the the building next to where Dave lives, and I see Dave's out on the porch. And what's interesting about this is I almost never see Dave out on his porch, ever. He's out on his porch, and I'm going door-to-door, and I'm thinking, surely, God, you do not want me to ask Dave if he wants to be in a home Bible study. It took the man nearly two years just to tell me his name. (laughs) I don't want to ask Dave about the Bible study today, not today. And God, again, because he's smarter than me, said, go ask him. (laughs) So I went up on the porch and I said, Dave, I said, I have this paper. It walks through what the Bible says about how God can help us with life. I want to give it to you if you want to have it. 
If not, that's totally fine. I'm still going to come here with food and do what we do. Would you like to have this paper? And Dave looked at me and he said, you know what, Kevin? I think I'd like to see that. Now, what you need to know about Dave is one of the tattoos on his arm says lost soul. Lost soul. That's a hurting man. I'm going to tell you what. That is the power of presence right there. Dave is not taking a Bible study paper. He's not coming to Jesus. And I believe with all my heart that Dave is going to come to Jesus at some point. He's not taking that Bible study paper. He's not coming to Jesus if you show up one time at his door. You're getting nothing from Dave if you show up one time. You're actually not going to get anything if you show up ten times. You might have to go back for one or two years before you get anything from Dave. But that's the power of presence right there. You go and you go back. And God starts to do things because the truth is, I told the kids yesterday, I'm not the part, I'm not like the, the, I don't have the strongest faith in the world. I go home, I tell my wife these things, and she's like, yeah, obviously. You knew that was going to happen. And I'm like, why did you know that was going to happen? My wife just believes everything. She can't, she apologized for not being here. She's been very ill, uh, having lots of trouble with her hip and legs in the past eight or nine months. She has tremendous faith. I'm always pleasantly surprised. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I walk away going, wow, that is crazy. I never would have thought that guy with the shirt that says evil on it would have ever taken a Bible study paper. Isn't that awesome? The power of presence. There's a little blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl in Mount Union. We met her five or six years ago when we were just doing this part-time. This little girl is probably the most difficult little girl. She's eight years old now. She's probably one of the most difficult little girls we've ever worked with. She, would, she was so difficult in our clubs that one day we decided to have two clubs so she could only mess up one of them. <laughs> we separated the kids into two groups and we put them in different parts of Divin Park in Mount Union. So she went to her one group and messed it up and then ran across the, the playground and came screaming. <laughs> Screaming, almost like demon-possessed screaming to disrupt the other one, and then went back and forth several times so she could blow both of them up. When we would try to do our worship songs, we'd take the kids to church in the wintertime and, and do a program indoors when it's too cold to be outside. She would just be impossible. We'd have to take her out and have someone deal with her one-on-one over and over again. This little girl has moved five times in the last two years. Five times. We've been able to track her through every move and stay engaged in her life. That's what's the beauty of the work we do. Five times we've been able to be with her. She's been found eating garbage out of, looking for food in the neighbor's garbage. She's been found on the front porch of the neighbor's house at five o'clock in the morning sleeping because her parents went to bed probably drunk, not realizing that all the kids were not in the house and they locked the doors. Her natural father tried to stab her mother, and I don't doubt that she's ever going to see that man again. Her stepdad's in and out of prison. But today, we're engaged with this whole family. Today, the family is actually doing much better two years later. And this little girl... I've never seen transformation in a person in my life like this. She stands, I just was with her Thursday. She stands in the front when we do our worship songs, does all the motions and sings with all of her heart, and we haven't had to deal with her for any issue for months and months and months. It's the power of presence. She loves Backyard Club. She always did love it, even when she was ruining it. She always loved it. But we just kept in there with her. You see the power of presence. No, we're not walking away. One of the most troubling things is things, things that make me angry. There's a huge church in Altoona. One of the neighborhoods that we have a club functioning in, they picked up kids there in a van and took them to church. It's a gigantic church, a wealthy church. They would pull kids out of this terrible neighborhood and take them to their Awana program. You know what they decided last year? Those kids are too complicated for their water program. They stopped sending that bus into that neighborhood. 
You talk about devastating message for the church to send to little children. You wonder why there's people with lost soul tattooed on their arm. That'll do it to you, don't you think? Kid that loves to come to your Awana program, and then the bus stops coming. We're not coming in there anymore. You people are too complicated for us. You're messing up. Here's the thing. The church is so terrified that if we cross the street, these people, i never forget this. When I went to Mount Union a couple years ago, I had a meeting with the ministerium. I was extremely discouraged because I spent an hour being grilled on things like liability insurance. What if they sue you? What if they sue me? I mean, we have liability insurance. But I'm not worried about being sued. What if they sue? The church is so focused on, if we go help them, they might take what we have. Good. It's not ours anyway. This is not yours. This is God's. This is for them. It's not for us. It's for them. It belongs to God. But we're terrified. We're afraid that we might lose what we have. And God says, it's not yours anyway. It belongs to me. The power of presence. So I say to you, what if you went to a family? And then what if you went back a couple weeks later? What if you got to know them? What if you got to know their children when their birthdays are? And you just showed up on the kid's birthday and had a little present for them. Just the type of things we do, but we do it in mass. And it's powerful, but what I, I'm going to tell you the one thing I know that's more powerful than backyard ministries going. It's you going. That is far more powerful than backyard ministries going. The last thing that I want to talk to you about is a power that I have real difficulty explaining. I've seen it over and over again. I was in Lewistown this summer, and I came across a very difficult situation. A car had pulled up to this house, and these two adults had picked up this 10-year-old boy, put him in the car, and driven away. And there was this Hispanic gentleman, and he was a hardened, hardened uh, Hispanic man, probably, I, I would say, around my age, but looked much older. The type of person when you watch the shows about prisons and you see someone that's been a hardened criminal for years, it's what he looks like. And he was standing on the sidewalk and he was just screaming at these people in Spanish and cursing at them as they drove away with this boy. And I was walking through the neighborhood giving soup away because that's what I do. And this man was walking back to his house and I was walking towards his house and there was no way for me to escape the situation. Now, I want you to understand... I run from stuff like that normally. <laughs> I see something like that, I'm like, whoa, I'm going the other way. But I couldn't avoid it. He was right there, and I knew God wanted me to be there. And so as he walked to his house, he looked at me and had tremendous anger in his eyes. And I said, again, because I'm not that smart, would you like some soup? <laughs> I don't know what else to say. I had soup. I didn't know what to say to this man. Would you like some soup? He said, No. No thanks. And he sat down on a little stool in front of his house, in front of his apartment door. And he looked at me and he said, now, I had known this man. I maybe met him one or two times before. His name's Jose. He looked at me and he said, could you give me some advice? I thought, sure. That's awesome. He said, I, I see you in this neighborhood. I know why you're here. I know what you're doing here. I'm in a really bad situation right now. Those people, they just drove away. They took my son from me. And I want to go and kill them right now. That's what he said. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen this. I've seen a lot of angry people in my life. I never saw murder in somebody's eyes, but I saw murder in Jose's eyes that day. I saw a man fully capable of doing what he just said to me. He said, I want to go kill them. I need help. And I said, well, the only thing I have that I can share with you, Jose, is this. I follow Jesus. I try to follow Jesus. And what Jesus said was that when someone hurts you, no matter how bad they hurt you, the right thing to do and the best thing to do is to forgive them. I said, you know, Jose, you could go kill those people right now. 
you're not going to feel any better. Your life's not going to be any better, and your son's life's not going to be any better. But I will guarantee you this. If you forgive those people right now, you will feel better right now. <laughs> you will feel better right now. God can help you right now if you will decide to forgive them for what they just did. And I said, you know, Jose, the thing about Jesus that's awesome to me is that Jesus didn't just tell us these things. He just didn't say, you do this. Jesus did them. I said, when Jesus was on the cross, he looked down at the people who had crucified him. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And as I got into the middle of that passage, Jose started to repeat it with me. And then I saw something, I don't know that I've ever seen anything like it. I saw something wash over this man. I just saw the hatred and the anger and the murder just wash right out of him. Just completely out of his body. And a peace and a calm come across this man. And he looked at me and he said, thank you. I said, Jose, can I pray with you before I leave? He said, sure. I put my arm around Jose's shoulder. I began to pray, and as I began to pray with Jose, that hardened, hardened man stuck his head on my chest and just started to cry. That's the power of Jesus. See, that's the thing. I think, and I, just like anybody else, I go to the door, and my thought is, what on earth can I do for these people? I face situations like Jose, and I think, whoa, all I got soup in my hands. What do I do? This is the thing. You don't really have to do anything spectacular because when you as a Christian walk into a neighborhood, you take the power of Jesus with you. Jesus does some things, some things you could never, ever imagine. I wonder if you began to cross the street, what you would see. Jesus do. What I am absolutely convinced of in closing today is that the gospel of Jesus Christ works. It's real. This is not just some story we talk about and sing about. This is something we can do. We can experience. We can share with people. It works. It transforms people's lives. It changes people. It fixes things. Jesus said he came to heal the brokenhearted. Preach the gospel to the poor. There's a power in just going. If you'll cross the street, there's a power associated with going. If you keep crossing the street, there's a power associated with presence, of just showing up and continuing to show up. And there's a power that you take with you that is something that's totally incomprehensible to you and me that can heal the heroin addictions that can heal the families that can set things right remember what it says in the bible a voice in the wilderness crying prepare the way of the lord every mountain shall be brought low every valley shall be filled the crooked made straight and the rough smooth. That's what God can do. A man said to Jesus, how do I get to heaven? Jesus said, what's the Bible say? The man said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, do that, and you will get to heaven. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to share from your word today. I thank you for the message, Lord, that you gave to us, to me, to the rest of these dear folks. I thank you, Lord, for the time and effort these folks have already taken, Lord, in crossing the street. I thank you, God, that Beavertown Bible Church has been one of the um, foundational churches in helping backyard ministries to cross the street, God. I pray, God, a simple prayer today. I pray in every one of our hearts, beginning with mine, Lord, that you will compel us to understand the power of going, the power of presence, and the power of Jesus that comes with crossing the street. Compel us, Lord, to walk out of this place today 
absolutely committed to crossing the street and caring for the dying man. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.